Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aureli Frille. I'm an assistant teaching professor here at Syracuse and a member of our lecture committee. And I want to welcome you all to the Werner Seligman lecture featuring Lee Han and Hu Yan, who are founders of the of Drawing Architecture Studio. Thank you so much for coming. I want to point out that the Werner Seligman lecture is a really special lecture here at Syracuse. As many of you already know, Werner Seligman was an amazing educator and dean of this school from 1976 to 1990. And besides being a distinguished professor after his position as dean, he also taught at UT Austin, at the ETH, Cornell, Harvard, UVA, and Yale. But most importantly, he really put the school on the map, and we have an incredible amount of gratitude to him and what he accomplished. Okay, so before we start, um, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, if you'd like to enable captions, you can find the closed caption at the bottom of the Zoom interface. And we're going to address questions via the chat function after Lee Han and Hu Yan's lecture and their discussion with Dean Speaks. To ask a question, type your question in the chat room and Dean Speaks will ask the question for you. Please leave your mics muted for the duration of the lecture so as not to distract the lecturers and the viewers. So now I will turn things over to Dean Speaks who will formally introduce our lecturers this evening. Okay, thank you, Aurelie. Um, we're, I'm very, I'm thrilled uh, to be here uh, tonight, and um, it's actually not tonight for uh, Li Han and Hu Yan. Uh, um, it's morning. Uh, unfortunately for them, it's around 6 a.m., I think. Um, but we're thrilled, uh, we're very thrilled to have them uh, come and lecture for us uh, here at Syracuse Architecture. A um, couple things to say. Uh, as Aurelie said, this is a, this is a special lecture. Um, and it will be a special lecture. It's a special occasion and it'll be a terrific lecture. I, I have admired their work for a very long time and I know many, many of you will know their work and um, their work is, I think, their, I think their drawings have changed the way a lot of students in particular, young architects um, now approach drawing and also how they approach um, representing large complex systems like cities. Um, so I'm really excited to see the lecture tonight. Um, as Aureli said, uh, uh, they're gonna give a, a drawing architecture studio will make a presentation at the end of which um, I'll ask them a few questions and we'll have a little conversation and then we'll invite you all to type in uh, questions in the chat. Um, one, one thing, I, I just want to make a couple of general comments about uh, their relationship with our school. Not only are they giving the Werner Seligman lecture tonight, but they are also teaching, and this is very unusual, this is the first time we've done this, um, they are teaching a visiting critic studio uh, in Beijing for uh, about 15 or 16, I believe, uh, VC students. Um, and I think the topic of the Visiting Critics Studio is not exactly the lecture tonight, but there are some overlaps. Um, I know the, the, the studio that they're working on or working with the students on is also um, dealing with, with the vernacular, um, but it is also a dealing, I believe, and I'm not sure if they're going to talk about this, it's dealing with um, with the architectural, with drawings and with maquettes, but also with a very special um, concept in, in Chinese architecture uh, uh, that deals with copying, but it's not just copying. And, um, and it's actually making use of the vernacular and transforming the vernacular. So, um, so very excited to, to see that. Um, I'm not going to say much more because you didn't come here to hear me give an introduction. You came here to listen to a great lecture by two fantastic uh, architects. Um, oh, I should say um, um, that uh, Li Han is trained as an architect. Uh, he went to Kafa, the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, which is one of the great schools in China. Um, and then he also studied later at RMIT um, as uh, he studied architecture. 
Uh, Hu Yun uh, studied uh, at Concordia University and she studied uh, as a graphic designer. And as I was saying earlier, I really like graphic designers because graphic designers do graphic design and don't imagine that they can do architecture, but architects do architecture and also think they can do graphic design, which of course they can't, they're terrible. Architects are terrible at graphic design. Um, so I'm very happy we have a real graphic designer here tonight. But what we do have is two great uh, thinkers, two great um, uh, architects and, and illustrators. And not only are their drawings beautiful, but they have a lot of fantastic concepts and a framework to describe it. So without further ado, I give you Drawing Architecture Studio and I look forward to their presentation. Welcome, thank you for coming. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thanks Michael for your introduction. And uh, hello everyone, this is Li Han. And this is Hu Yan. And uh, it was really honor, uh, I'm really honored to be invited to share our works in Syracuse architecture. And uh, okay, we will start and share our screen. Uh, it's okay, everyone can see it. Just one second, okay. Okay, yeah. yeah. Look, yeah, it's good. Okay, okay. great. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, then we will start. Yeah. Um, the topic of our lecture is vernacular narrative. It is a clue that we only found out when we were preparing for this lecture. For those projects that we are going to share with you today, and when we work on them, we only treat them as individual projects. We didn't realize any internal connections between them. But now when we look back, we suddenly see a very clear line that connects all of them together. This reminded us a um, very interesting quote from uh, Steve Jobs. You, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. After we uh, prepared this lecture, we totally agreed with him. Unlike many young architecture studios in China, we started our practice with a book. In 2013, we published a little bit about Beijing. We used architectural drawing to uh, depict some, some most interesting venues in the city. Architectural drawing might not be the perfect instrument to document urban development because urban development, especially in China, is very fast, but it takes very long time to do a good drawing. So very often, even before we finish the drawing, the, the place has gone. But the biggest advantage of architectural drawing is that you can represent some very complex urban environments, like hundreds and uh, thousands of small spaces in one singular image. So we have the strong belief that architectural drawing shall be considered as an independent art form uh, compared to uh, perspective paintings, videos, and photography. You can hardly achieve that uh, kind of um, purpose in those medium. So our strong belief has turned into a, almost like obsession that carries on in our practice over the years. This book was very well received and was awarded one of the 10 most beautiful books of China in 2013. We got very encouraged. So two years later, we uh, made a second one, a little bit of Beijing Dashila. Dashila is a very famous old Hutong area in the city in, of Beijing. And here you will see very typical small lanes and uh, houses, different houses built in, uh, throughout the years. For this book, we concentrated on the form of a uh, graphic novel. We tell the stories about people, how people live in the Hutong area of Dashlar and how they interact with the Hutong, Hutong environment and the city. In other words, this is a book about architectural narrative. When we talk about narrative, we are not looking for something very dramatic like what you would see in Hollywood movies. We always focus on the daily life of ordinary people in vernacular environment because we believe this is something most people are experiencing every day. And uh, we believe that um, we will have more shared emotions from those kind of stories. And we're always based on our stories in uh, on reality. 
um, we always do the interviews, do the site visit, and uh, do some other form of observation on the city. We also believe that um, very often reality is more powerful than fiction. Here we would like to share with you one of the stories from the, from the book is called Micro Yuan. Uh, Micro Yuan is an award-winning project by the renowned Chinese architect Zhang He. Uh, we also based this story on our interview with Mr. Zhang and our visit to the, uh, this courtyard and uh, also the discussion with the neighbors in this area. From those uh, uh, materials, we collect a lot of interesting fragments that uh, we created a story from. This courtyard was almost abandoned before the renovation by Zhang He. All the neighbors uh, have moved out and uh, the, sh the house has become very shabby and uh, just uh, very, uh, seems a very un uh, un uh, comfortable place to live. And only uh, little animals like this cat will find it as a paradise. There's only one neighbor left in the courtyard. We call him Uncle Wang. Uncle, uh, we talked to he, Uncle Wang for a couple of times when we visited the yard. He was uh, very um, lonely and uh, was eager to talk to strangers. And uh, in this courtyard, there's a big tree in the center. When we visited there, it was autumn time. Uh, so you will see the falling leaves all over the courtyard, which makes you feel especially, uh, particularly sad. This is how uh, Zhang Ke made his first appearance in the story. He walked into the yard and looking up to this big tree in the center and uh, was surrounded by the shabby houses. And this tree plays a very important role in his design and also in our story. We once asked Zhang Ke about why he picked up this very small project. He shared with us some very beautiful memories of uh, Hu Chong. Uh, during his university years in Beijing, he often rode a bike through the Hutong and uh, at snowy night, he could clearly smell the smoke from those coal stoves used by residents for cooking and heating. He would see an old lady walking uh, slowly across the entrance of the courtyard and uh, disappeared. Then suddenly a young girl showed up for one moment, he would think that this young girl was that old lady in her childhood. And later, when he continued his studies in the States, he had a huge photograph of Hu Chong hanging on the wall of his apartment that, as a memory from home. Uh, all his flashbacks are so vivid and graphic, so we think it's important to keep them in our story as a background for his design. A courtyard originally was designed only, made only for one family, but over the years, because of uh, uh, various uh, historical reasons, today, uh, most courtyards in Beijing are shared by several households. And uh, all the families, they never get enough room, so they have to fight with, with each other, try to uh, build a, a small kitchen or storage room in the courtyard for their own. Uh, those, all those uh, constructions are considered as illegal structure by the government. Today, when we talk about Hu Chong restoration or preservation, the first thing people will say is to uh, take down those illegal structures. But uh, Zhang Ke has a different opinion. Uh, he said he would use the phrase illegal, uh, unregistered architecture to replace illegal structure because he thinks those constructions are the reflection of the real need by the people living in Hu Tong, and uh, they are very important part of the history, uh, a common memory shared by several generations. When we talk about uh, respect of Hu Tong history, we should respect those from maybe 200 years ago, but we should also respect those from a couple of decades ago. His, his argument um, reminded us of a very uh, popular TV drama in the 1990s called uh, The Happy Life of Talkative Zhang Damin. The protagonist, uh, the guy here, he, um, he and his big family lived in a courtyard uh, with several other neighbors. And um, when he and his brother got married, they didn't have room for their own. So after fighting with the neighbors, Zhang Damin built a small house in the courtyard for himself and his wife. 
there was a tree in the um, courtyard that he cannot, he was not allowed to remove. So he had to build his house around the tree. So the tree literally grows through their bed and uh, uh, at night he will go down underneath the tree, uh, uh, underneath the bed to water the tree. And after his son was born, the cradle was also hanging on the branches. Uh, based on our experience in Hu Chong life, we think this story is so true, even though it is from a TV drama. So we decided to include that in our story as a reference to explain why those illegal structures exist. This is how it looks like for the in the final design of Jungke, uh, Jungke's uh, project, and uh, the whole courtyard was tra transformed in give a, a completely new um, facelift, and uh, all the houses here, uh, both registered and unregistered, uh, they were turned into a much better condition and in a much beautiful condition, and the tree still stands in the center of the courtyard. So we also end, uh, end our story with this image where the tree is in the center and all the uh, houses around it are turned into activity rooms and library for the children in the neighborhood. And Uncle Wang here, he also had a um, um, happier life because he had more opportunity to talk with the neighbors. Uh, to Zhang He, a tree is a symbol of family. He thinks this is a, a tree is the original form of a, a family where people will gather under the tree in a circle. So we think this beautiful image is also an echo to his poetic memory about the family and this Hutong life. Okay, uh, when I was uh, working around in Hutong area, I can always find a lot of uh, buildings uh, built by local residents. Uh, they are very uh, direct, straightforward, and sometimes even uh, shameless. Uh, they are poor construction and uh, with the cheapest materials. Uh, we call them vernacular construction. And uh, uh, however, I can sense a special beauty from this poor construction. Um, I was wondering one day to find a chance to get them recorded because they are illegal construction and uh, will disappear soon. So uh, in 2017, uh, we made a teaching studio in Beijing University of Civil Engineering and uh, Architecture. Uh, we asked 200 first year students uh, uh, to go to Hutong area to find uh, vernacular construction and uh, get them recorded by a 1 to 50 model. And because they are first year students, they are not limited by a uh, standard of discipline and they use a very direct way to make these models, just like those residents made their uh, buildings. So the result has surprisingly good actually. Uh, watching these models and the drawings uh, give me more inspirations than those fashionable archi uh, architecture on magazines. Uh, so I think there are two types of beauty. Uh, one type is uh, clever beauty, another is stunt beauty. Uh, which one's better? Uh, I remember uh, American architecture studio Moss uh, once talked about the dump architecture. Uh, he, uh, they said that uh, they like dump architecture, they dislike uh, uh, clever architecture. Dump architecture is about construction, not about idea. Uh, it's about things, models, making drawings. It's prefer not to say too much. Uh, it's uh, what you see is what, what you get, uh, what you see is what you get. So I pretty agree with their opinions. Um, later, we published a book called called Hutong Mushroom uh, by collecting uh, these models and the drawings. Uh, we also named our teaching studio as uh, Degree Zero uh, Urban Studies. Uh, the concept of Degree Zero referred to uh, um, Roland, uh, uh, Roland Barthes' uh, uh, Degree Zero Literature. But here, we don't use this word in a very sophisticated, sophisticated way. Uh, we are calling for a simple and a more intuitive uh, urban studies. Uh, for me, an urban study doesn't have to be a very deep theory 
or a complicated analysis. It can be about things, making drawings and models uh, to experience the interesting uh, constructions, architecture you found, you found in the corner of the city. And the next project is uh, exhibition design. Uh, last year, we are uh, invited to take part in exhibi uh, uh, exhibition. It's a quite interesting uh, exhibition. The curator uh, made architects, uh, artists, and uh, graphic design into a group. And within this group, uh, everyone has an equal position. That means there's no serve role or serving role. Uh, everyone work together to present an exhibition. Uh, the curator want to uh, break the boundary between different different disciplines through this way. Uh, we are uh, take part in uh, we will take part in this exhibition as architect to uh, in charge of uh, exhibition design, uh, ex exhibition space design. Mm. Uh, very coincidentally, uh, the artist in our group, uh, his name is Li Qing. Uh, he is very interested in vernacular construction as well. Uh, one of his exhibit work called uh, Hangzhou House. Uh, he take a lot of photo, photos about this uh, suburban house made by farmers, local farmers uh, near Hangzhou. And they are looking pretty new, but actually this house already abandoned because the city expand uh, quickly and the land was uh, inquired by the government. Uh, so after they get the compensation, they moved out. So uh, this building seems under construction, but actually they, they are already ruins. So we de developed the idea, uh, new ruins. Uh, we imagine the whole uh, ex ex exhibition space as a demolished house. So you can see these high walls and the low walls uh, implying the ruined walls. But on the other hand, it's very new, very clean. Each walls are uh, well placed and uh, every material materials are tightly fit. So we try to create this uh, contradictory feeling, uh, which we sensed from those photos. And uh, the window on the wall actually is artist's work. He liked to put the real window frame on his painting. But uh, for audience, you can also think it's the uh, old uh, window frame of this demolished house. And we put these Hangzhou house photos on the ground. But you can also think maybe it's the old magazines or photos uh, collecting by the house owner and uh, he stored them into the basement of the building. And the uh, left part carpet uh, is an artist's work. He take uh, the uh, uh, floor tiling of Hangzhou house into photos and uh, printed on the carpet. And the right part is a new carpet we made to uh, simulate the artist's work. Uh, use similar pattern and similar color. And you can see uh, it seems that a carpet uh, uh, a new carpet becomes old and you can feel uh, time pass by, uh, goes by. Uh, by doing this, we try to break up the boundary between uh, the artist's work and the exhibition space, so they are mixed together. And uh, at the beginning, we want to actually construct a one-to-one -one scale of Hangzhou house because uh, Li Qing has a uh, video uh, show, a video work, so he need a black room. Uh, but later we changed our idea. Uh, we saw the photo taken by German photogra uh, photographer uh, Marcus um, Book. Uh, he shoot the re architectural remains on the wall. The building uh, has disappeared, and uh, but you can imagine the space uh, based on these traces on the wall. And uh, this made actually the disappearing building more attractive. So I feel sometimes the absence of architecture is even more powerful. Um, actually what we did in architect drawing uh, actually is doing the similar uh, thing. We try to uh, pre represent the 3D space with two dimensional uh, media. 
So instead of constructing a one-to-one -one scale Hangzhou house, we made one-to-one -one scale Hangzhou house image. Uh, but this image uh, are not uh, drawn. They are built by materials, three types of material, carpet, uh, felt, and uh, foam brick. Uh, by doing this, actually, we uh, materializing the image. So the image become uh, the wall of architecture. Uh, but at the same time, this image also implying uh, some space disappearing. So in this condition, uh, the image, the, uh, the space and the architecture are kind of mixed together. That's the direction we uh, want to go in forward. Uh, this is a final view of the exhibition and uh, it's a space uh, that mix artist work and the exhibition space mix the image, architecture, and space together. The previous projects are all inspired by small houses, either in the Hutong of Beijing or in the suburb of Hangzhou. There's another type of architecture we really love about is apartment building, especially those in Beijing. They have nothing special from the appearance, just some regular and boring social housing. But what fascinates us most is how the residents reshape those buildings over the years with their daily life. They have made um, uh, a lot of very interesting building stories. The first story I want to share with you is uh, the Samsara of building number 42 on Dirty Street. This is a piece we created in 2017 for Shenzhen, Hong Kong, Bai City, uh, Banali. This project consists of four architect drawings in which we'll tell story of uh, the transformation of an apartment, apartment building in a time span of 10 years. Building number 42 is a, just a regular six floor apartment building in Beijing, but its location is very uh, uh, prominent. It's located in the um, uh, Sanlitun area of Beijing, the, the most fashionable shopping area in Beijing. And uh, here, uh, it, there is a very famous shopping mall called the Taiku Li. Uh, the dirty street is here, the streets connecting the south and the north part of Taiku Li. And it didn't have a formal name for this street, only everyone knows about the nickname Dirty Street. And the building number 42 is just located right at the corner. We first uh, found out this building in 2008. In that year, the south part of Taiguli just opened and this building also started its own commercial transformation. It's not rare that uh, the lower floors of apartment buildings are used as a com commercial unit, but there are some uh, distinctive factors about this case. First of all, it is very international because the building is very located, very close to the uh, in, uh, embassy area in Beijing. So you will see a lot of foreigner, all kinds of foreigners among the uh, native uh, customers. And the commercial activities are very diverse. You can find uh, nail salon, tattoo shops, uh, fashion shops, bars, restaurants, and a lot of street vendors in the evening. Thirdly, uh, the first floor of this apartment is half basement. That means uh, the second floor is also very close to the ground. So uh, many shops are opened on the second floor or one shop will take uh, two floors together, become a multi-level shopping, a commercial uh, space. It took us half a year to document all the commercial units in this building. And in the end, we created um, a panorama of a uh, explosive axometric uh, projection. And here we documented all the um, uh, interesting uh, in interior activities. What's interesting about this building to us is that uh, from the upper levels, upper levels, it still looks like apartment building, but uh, for the first, one, the first and the second floor, it looks already like a small shopping center. And for this drawing, we kept a black and white light drawing style because we want to show this uh, very objective uh, attribute of documentation. Sorry. Okay. And then it came to the year of 2016. And uh, because we also 
uh, go to San Lintuan very often for shopping and dining. So we kept our observation on this building. Over the years, you can see that um, it's a commercial development has been uh, put into uh, its peak and uh, the, the shops have been open, expanded into the street and it become much more uh, prosperous and the traffic is also, there's more traffic than before. And uh, there are more shops and they are open to upper floors. Here you can even find a hair salon on the top. It's a neon sign and it looks almost like a golden crown to the building. And the whole building seems like will become, um, it will become a sleepless city. However, we started to smell uh, a sense of the end of glory. On the ground, we found this big uh, billboard set up by the government, seeing that uh, the government will crack down those uh, first floor apartment turned business. Those shops, they are all transformed from the original balconies and the windows of the apartment. So to the government, they are illegal structures, just like those in the Hutong. So uh, this is a warning from the government. But at that time, in 2016, we didn't really believe that they would do so, which think that it's just a, um, maybe just a warning in form. For this piece, we want to concentrate the uh, concentrated on the, uh, the nightlife of San Twin. Uh, there are two viewpoints in the drawing. One is downward and the other is upward. When looking downward, you will see all the um, exciting nightlife on the street and inside the rooms. And you can almost hear the, the, the noise out of the picture. And here we also uh, keep this blue signage here for the warning. And uh, everything just looks like a, a very happy and uh, people will uh, just enjoy their nightlife without uh, any worry. And if you look upward, you will see a sky filled with uh, shining stars with a jolly happy atmosphere from heaven to the earth. One interesting thing we found in this building is that uh, in the evening here on the middle uh, floors of the, of the building, they always look very dark and seem that no people live here. But when you see uh, get closer, you will see the clothes hanging on the balcony. So in the end, we found that but we found out that uh, the those uh, middle floors they were all rent out to the shop owners downstairs. So uh, the shop staff they can work very late at night, uh, and then in the morning when everything gets quiet, they can go upstairs to sleep. Uh, without any outer force, this building has developed a very sustainable ecosystem for itself. So this is how it looks uh, for the final representation. The third piece uh, was about the event happened on April the 24th, uh, 20, uh, 2017. The crackdown did happen. We learned the news that day and rushed to the site to take some photos. The whole thing looks very astonishing and they just took down all the facades of the, the, uh, the, of the shops and everything looks like just after a huge earthquake. And this thing reminded us uh, of drawings by Labis Woods. In his drawing, Woods often uh, represent the cities at war. He, his buildings will be bombed and left with ruins. But what's different here for building number 42 is that on one hand here, you will see the demolition or the rubbles and the ruins. On the other hand, there's another team of workers quickly install the bricks, <laughs> new window frames, and uh, restore the original form of balcony on the facade of the building. So there is a construction inside the damage. <coughs> and what's more interesting that the shop owners, they are still inside. Sorry. <coughs> they just uh, stay inside and um, watch everything happening in front of them and can, cannot do anything. <coughs> in this piece, we try to explore the excitement of uh, violence in architecture drawing. We use a lot of drawing techniques to uh, represent the rubbles and the ruins, and then um, <clears throat> all these distorted structures. We want to show this uh, combination of construction and the uh, damage, and also the exist ex existence of um, 
shop owners in indoors to against the, uh, against this crackdown. With all this uh, contradiction and uh, tension, this building has been pushed to its most dramatic moment. This is how it looks like half a year later. We revisited the site and uh, found out it gets a completely new look, new colors, uh, new flower beds, new fences for the conditioner. You can hardly recognize it and uh, there's nothing to do with dirty anymore. It seems that everything has been rearranged with the best wishes that the community will become a, a cleaner, more comfortable and uh, safer place. But uh, we really wondered if it is really the case. <coughs> we documented this new look of the building. And uh, here in the back, we also illustrate the, the beautiful cityscape of Salitun. Uh, so we our question is that um, this is, seems like a very uh, planned, uh, beautiful life for people, but all those uh, previous nightlife subcultures they are all sacrificed for this kind of um, better place. But is this really a better place that's needed by the people here? The those culture those uh, nightlife they are also very important culture, part of the city culture, and. Uh, um, and we use these uh, uh, visuals uh, borrowed from socialist propaganda posters to illustrate everything as a utopia because we can't help wondering if this is really people want, if people have a say in this kind of transformation. And we feel very lucky that we get to know this building number 42 and were able to witness its transformation in 10 years. Uh, in all these drawings, everything is from reality. There's nothing we fabric fabricated or imagined. But we think that uh, in the end, the building gives us a very, the, the greatest drama we can ever have. So we feel very lucky that we were part of, it, of its history. Okay, uh, well, uh, although the uh, vernacular construction of building 48, uh, were demolished. Um, in other old resi residential buildings, the vernacular construction are born every day, actually. Uh, one of the most important uh, topology is the self-enclosed windows and the balconies. Uh, the balcony become a very talkative uh, issue last year because of the pandemic. Uh, this photo was taken in Italy uh, the isolated local residents turned the uh, uh, balcony into a music, a music stage. So the balcony become a symbol of uh, interaction between public space and uh, uh, private space. But here in Beijing, we don't use balcony in this way. Uh, the photo in the left shows how people uh, turned a window into a balcony. And the right photo shows how people uh, turned an open balcony into a bay window. So in this area, actually, it's hard to tell which part is balcony, which part is window. Uh, if you say the um, Italian balcony is a kind of poetic usage of balcony, uh, here in Beijing, it's more a pragmatic usage of balcony. Uh, however, when I look at this, self-enclosed balconies, uh, I, I do have a, a, a poetic uh, imagination because uh, in China, uh, people live in city cannot buy a rural land to build their uh, holiday house uh, due to the land policy. Um, but actually everyone has this little holiday house for him. And while looking at these boxes hanging on the wall, I have a I always had the illusion that these boxes are the mini holiday house for each family. They are in the air. So um, two years ago, uh, my friend asked me to renovate his uh, apartment. Uh, his apartment has a very special balcony. It's kind of staggered balcony. And uh, due to Chinese law, uh, the area of staggered balcony uh, are not counted in total construction area. That means 
uh, its free balcony for each apartment buyer. Uh, however, everyone, every buyer, when they move in, they will, the first thing they will do is enclose the balcony and get more interior space. Uh, the word free means you don't need to pay anything. But they also has, it, it also has the meaning of freedom. Um, however, when you look at these photos, although these balcony are enclosed by different family, they all look the same, uh, just glass boxes. So uh, the free balcony uh, doesn't bring freedom. So when my uh, when we design my friend's balcony, we try to uh, build a mini holiday house on his balcony. Uh, instead of flat uh, roof, we use a, a circular roof, and uh, we have a very big roof window. Uh, we also have these two side windows sticking out. Uh, like horns, because we, uh, I think the small house is more like a creature rather than a uh, uh, cubic box building. Uh, uh, this drawing we made to present the night view of the balcony, uh, uh, because I think when the environmental going dark, you're kind of losing the reference of scale. So this mini house become uh, a real two floor a uh, holiday house and my friend become a giant. But he doesn't like this drawing. He thinks he looks like a monster. And the right one shows the uh, interior view of the balcony. And uh, because this is a new uh, residential area, it has a relatively strict property management. So you cannot stick in your balcony out. Uh, instead, we sticking the balcony inwardly, taking a little space space of dining room. Uh, so uh, this ex expanded balcony become a, a, become a wood cottage. Uh, we deliber deliberately use this exotic style like a Japanese tea house uh, to emphasize this feeling of vacation. So although it's a small, it's mini, uh, but this mini house is just next to my friend's apartment. So he can give him a holiday break anytime he wants. So this is uh, my friend and I, and uh, he was really proud of his uh, balcony. And after that, we published a book called Apartment Blossom. Uh, it's a second book of our uh, degree zero urban studies. Uh, it's focused on the self-enclosed uh, windows and the balconies. And again, this time we asked 200 uh, first year students in Beijing University uh, uh, of civil engineering and architecture. Uh, this time we asked each of them to make two models, uh, two balcony models. One is based on the real uh, balcony they found in the old neighborhood. Another one uh, is designed by themselves. Uh, honestly speaking, I prefer the one they found in the old neighborhood. Uh, this is the uh, final view of, uh, this is the exhibition um, uh, after the class. Uh, 400 models stacked together making a super long uh, slab apartment building and uh, the exhibit space is not big enough and uh, the building extends to the corridor. Uh, the scenes are very spectacular. Uh, maybe a little bit is exaggerated compared to the uh, real situation, but this sort of richness of everyday life bought by these vernacular constructions, uh, I think is the most, in, most attractive part of the old residential building. And when I look at these uh, models uh, separately, I still can feel a strong sense of beauty. Um, this composition, uh, the color, uh, the material, they are all good, actually they are all good designs uh, for even for the elevation of a small house. Uh, when I watch this photo actually, I can, I can feel a sense of beauty of model itself. Uh, 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 that means uh, if it's a building, maybe it's dangerous, uh, it's going to collapse anytime. But as a model, it really shows uh, the you know the character of the model. You can tell the 
fragile material distorted by the glue uh, is a true representation of the model. Uh, in other words, it looks exactly like a model. And this one, maybe it's a boring facade, but uh, look at these plastic flowers. They are almost alive in this mini world. And this one maybe is not good in terms of architecture design, but in mini world, we have doll house. And I think it's a really um, lovely and cute doll house. So watching these models made me uh, rethinking the role of the model. Uh, we always think model as a tool to de developing design, uh, to develop design or to present design. Uh, but actually model has its own value. It has its deep uh, independent, uh, he can play, its, uh, it has deep independent value. Uh, when I look at this African artist uh, Kingless work, you can say it's an architecture model, but also it's a sculpture. It's a three-dimensional dimension, uh, painting. Uh, definitely, it's a artist. It's independent artwork. Uh, Kinglis called his work as extreme maquettes. So inspired by him, we try to make our own uh, extreme maquette. We redraw the models uh, made by students and uh, print on paper and uh, fold the paper into many little boxes. We also made a tower like this, uh, a typical uh, classic European style. Uh, here in Beijing, this style represents uh, rich and expensive. Uh, this photo shows uh, the long, loneliness and smallness of people uh, when they're confronting the big gigantic building. Uh, Winston Churchill, Churchill once said, we shape the building, then the building shape us. Uh, but I think the Beijing residents will not agree with this word. They will say, we shape the building and then we reshape the building again. Uh, this is a process of our reshaping the building. Um, sorry. Uh, this is a final view of the model. Uh, I think if you light um, local res Beijing residents living in such type of building, uh, if you give them freedom, they will turn the building like this. So uh, this uh, classical European style mm -hmm. mixed up with vernacular constructions, generating a strong sense of absurdity. Uh, so this model uh, we made not for design, not for construction. Uh, this model stands for being model itself. It stands for entertaining, uh, for enjoying the freedom of the uh, mini world. Uh, although vernacular urban life has always been the main subject of our creation, uh, the story of the next project uh, didn't happen in the city. However, in the end, we found out that it still is closely related to the urban development in China. And Taobao Village, small acre city, was a piece we created in 2018 for Chinese Pavilion in Venice Banali. Uh, the subject of Taobao Village was given by the curator because the exhibition theme was our future countryside. Before we took on this uh, commission, we knew nothing about Taobao Village. So we did some research first. Taobao Village is not a name for any specific uh, village. It is actually an economic model. Over the years, be, with the booming development of e-commerce in China, many farmers find the opportunity to turn their home in the countryside into small businesses, produce all kinds of uh, products and uh, sell on Taobao.com, the largest e-commerce website in China. The products are sold all over to all over the country and even to abroad. And uh, when uh, one village, uh, as one village, if it's annual turnover or uh, the number of online stores reach to a certain level, the company Taobao will certify this village as Taobao village. We are very fascinated with the concept and the development of Taobao village. So we decided to do a group portrait for this phenomenon instead of um, depicting any singular Taobao village. We want to create. Um, a, a Taobao village in which we tell the stories of, about those farmers, how they transform their homes into part of this global e-commerce system. Uh, although the, uh, the village will be fictional, all the activities are uh, documentations from reality. 
because the core concept of Taobao Village is about home-run business in the countryside. That reminded us of Broad Acre City proposed by Frank Lloyd Wright in the 1930s. In his proposal, Wright uh, suggested each family in the suburb area can be given one acre of the land and uh, they, so they can be, uh, they, they can make a, a living by themselves on this land and uh, be self-reliant and getting away from big cities. Um, we think this is actually what actually happened in Taba village. The farmers, they don't have to rush to big cities for jobs and uh, they can make a good living at home. So we decided to borrow the plan of Broad Acre City as a foundation for the de design of our Taba village. But the first thing we need to change is uh, the unit and the scale of the plan. In Broad Acre City, it covers an area about 10 square kilometers. This is too large for us to draw. And the scale and the density are completely different here in the Chinese context. So we changed the unit from one acre to about 333 square meters. Here on the right, you can see our plan. Uh, the road grids are kept the same, but uh, the building, they become much larger and the density also increased. The total area we need to draw was also reduced dramatically. That's why we called our version Small Acre City. And then after we fill this plan with um, all kinds of architecture and the landscape we found in the Chinese countryside, you can hardly tell the uh, road grid. And we want to create this very um, robust uh, environment and atmosphere for this Taobao village as to show how country life can be as busy as uh, the urban life with the e development of e-commerce. And in Broad Acre City, Frank Lloyd Wright claimed that this is a decentralized plan. There's no central access. But after we closely studied his model, we still found this very implicit central access here. In the middle, he puts a, a school, uh, which we assume must be um, architecture school with him as a principal. And here uh, he puts the church. It seems that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright puts those uh, in spiritual institutions on a higher level in the hierarchy of planning. So we want to reinforce this hierarchy in our Chinese version because uh, hierarchy plays a very important role in urban planning here. We still have the school in the middle and down here on the access, we have the most local building. Uh, the government building, and uh, on the top, replace the church with a Chinese temple. Uh, we want to what we in, in this um, the 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 total although the total image of this village is fictional, but when you look at the, each individual uh, architecture, they, you can always find the prototype in real life. And uh, when it comes to the design of single architecture, here we want to try to experiment with the concept of copying. And when Taobao first started, it was very often connected to counterfeit, fake products and knockoffs. Things have improved uh, a lot in recent years, but still uh, copying has played a very important role in the Chinese contemporary culture, even in the architectural world. Uh, here you can see a very funny example that um, down here you have a, a chapel copied in Henan province and it was actually very good copy very well constructed, uh, although the building has nothing, no any uh, uh, um, practical function, and it was, uh, it got a lot of complaint from the local Buzi foundation so soon after it was demolished. But we often wondered that if copying always a bad thing. And here we have a more positive example. Uh, we have this black and uh, a, a, a same villa, although with a, a mirrored uh, plan, mirrored program. But uh, this uh, this work, they didn't get a complaint from the foundation, and uh, the building has become the new icon in Australian architecture. Uh, to us, copying actually can be some. Um, effective design strategy. Uh, in fact, in the, uh, uh, at the moment, we are teaching a, a visiting critique studio in Beijing with a Syracuse students. And the subject of our uh, studio is uh, copied in Beijing. We try to uh, experiment with the stra uh, design strategy of uh, copying for some, uh, to copy some uh, uh, interesting <coughs> 
masterpieces in the city of for the city of Beijing, and we look forward to the outcomes. And you can actually say uh, the small acre city, our small acre city is a copy from broad acre city. So the first thing we want to copy is some buildings by Frank Lloyd Wright. We turned his Guggenheim Museum into a showroom in for the toy factory. And uh, uh, one of his villa designs into a hot spring resort in the mountains. We did not only copy from uh, the design masters, we also copy from the vernacular architecture here. And for this temple design, we uh, have the, got this idea from a Yuanbao pagoda in Hebei province. We found this design in a very uh, popular online contest, uh, the annual ugliest building in China. We love this contest and every year you can see a lot of crazy ideas. And uh, for this pagoda, it was filled with this uh, golden ingers symbolizing fortune. We think it's perfect to put into the our Taobao village. And here is an, uh, an, part, uh, an uh, office building, a, a town government office building in Henan province, uh, copy, uh, which is a copy of uh, Tiananmen. And here we made a copy based on this copy for the local government building. And this set of photos, they are some uh, uh, farmers' houses uh, taken in the uh, southern China. When farmers uh, get uh, rich, they like to uh, build these kind of uh, fancy uh, villas for themselves, combining the Western and the Eastern architectural style. And this, this pagoda-shaped building is also from reality. It is from the Huaxi village, the richest village in China. So in the end, in the same picture, you will see the ugliest building from China and the most uh, beautiful architecture by design masters. Uh, we want to create this kind of both uh, real but surreal um, landscape uh, as a portrait as a as a, a portrait for the Chinese countryside. The ritual of the drawing is one to two. It was also given by the curator because of the exhibition design. Our solution was to make a mirrored uh, composition on the other half to so show the interior of the Taobao village, to tell the uh, internal logic how this uh, system functions. When it's, it comes to the interior, it's very interesting that you will find, um, you will lose the uh, local character. For those workshops, it's hard to tell if without people. Uh, whether this is in, in the States or in China or the, in Europe or in India, everything becomes very similar. We assume this is the result of global, globalization. So we want to uh, highlight this feature in the interior part. We use a lot of geometric uh, visual language like uh, grids to connect all the space into one unity. So make the whole village as a, one big part in this uh, e-commerce system. For each venue, you will see the comparison between the interior and the exterior. This is for a logistic company. And this is for the duckery and uh, the temple. Here inside, you will see the giant statue of Buddha. When we first completed this uh, Taobao village piece, uh, we thought this is only as um, another experiment with vernacular narrative in countryside. But later we gave some deeper thinking. When we work on this project, the city of Beijing was promoting a policy of de-densification. The government saw that there were too many people, uh, too big population, and uh, it creates a lot of problems for the city. They want people from other cities to go back home, leave Beijing. Uh, we didn't necessarily agree with policy, but we also wonder if the de-densification is a must, what can people do after they go home? And then we, after we studied the concept of border acre city, we found that this is also a plan about uh, the densification. Frank Lloyd Wright also claimed that uh, there's too many problems in big cities and people will have better life in the countryside. So, and, and his idea is not uh, alone in the history of architecture. When we look back, we can see many other examples from the Soviet Union, from Japan and from Europe all those proposals, the architect proposed a uh, uh, life in the remote land and 
staying away from big cities. Um, but none of those proposals was realized. However, uh, on the country, uh, Taobao village has been proven as a successful solution for the densification. And this is not a proposal by uh, architects, not any uh, plan by the government, and even not a plan by the Taobao company. It is found, found out by the farmers themselves with the observation of new technology and uh, logistic system. They were able to uh, base their own life and in their own home without rushing to a big city far away. So we think that uh, in the end, there are uh, several levels of meaning in this piece. First of all, we experimented with the, uh, the concept of copying in the, in the design of this village. We played with the classic ideas from history of architecture with the Chinese contemporary culture. And secondly, we take this piece as a critical thinking to those unrealistic utopian proposals by those elite architects uh, compared to the more feasible solutions invented by the masses. And uh, lastly, we think Taobao Village is actually the ultimate realization of the concept of a uh, broad acre city. So we very, we are very, very curious that what if, what Frank Lloyd Wright would say if he sees the development of Taobao Village. Okay, uh, the last projects are about city of Chongqing, uh, a city which I think full of vernacular narratives. Um, the first project is a, a big mural we made for a creative park uh, of Chongqing. We call this drawing uh, Chongqing Jungle. Um, Chongqing is the largest city in West China and uh, it's a mountain city. There are two big rivers running across the city, the center of the city. So make the terrain of the city changes drastically. Uh, you can see the train uh, pass you over your head. So uh, people call Chongqing eight dimensional city. So uh, at the beginning, we refer to this Hong Kong drawing made by the Ha Hadid because uh, I think these two cities shares uh, similar landscape, mountain, water. Uh, but when we made this sketch, we think uh, in this scale, the city always look too flat, just like we look at the mountain on the airplane. So we enlarge the scale and the play with this uh, combination of multiple, uh, multi-projection of axiometric drawing, which we have played for many years to uh, show this uh, feeling of eight dimensions. Uh, I also want to talk about the content of the drawing. Uh, uh, this drawing is actually made up of uh, many famous uh, tourist attraction of Chongqing. But in terms of tourist attraction, Chongqing is quite different from other cities. For example, in Beijing, uh, the tourist attraction is Forbidden City, Summer Palace. In Shanghai, maybe a fashionable shopping center, Disneyland. But here in Chongqing, the, um, the tourist attraction are uh, like the train station inside a residential building, a very huge uh, overpass. Uh, and uh, a 24 floor residential building without lifts. So Chongqing actually is a city, uh, uh, its attraction are all uh, vernacular uh, spectacles. Uh, so that's why we love Chongqing so much. Uh, they give us a lot of inspirations. Uh, the bottom part is the CBD area, a lot of skyscrapers speaking in different direction. And uh, then when they move, move up, you can see this overpass, all this, uh, the shopping center under, just under the uh, uh, bridge and uh, all these uh, vernacular obstacles are uh, in the top area. And uh, in, in top, you can, we change the angle, it's uh, going, uh, looking up a word, a looking up angle. And uh, when uh, there's a, 
is expect the effect when we install this drawing on this grill billboard. Uh, because it's grill, so some uh, information of the drawing are missing. So when you look at this drawing in the distance, it was like a pixel and a bit of abstract. But when you look at this ring in the uh, enclosed in this direction, uh, this missing part actually are folded, uh, folded into the bottom of each grill. Uh, so the drawing, the whole drawing is uh, uh, folded in and out. So make the whole image distorted. Uh, that's actually exactly uh, uh, what we want to pursue. It's a feeling of eight dimensional. So compared to uh, mount destroying on a flight wall, we prefer this uh, effect. And the last project I want to show is an ongoing project. Uh, I want to show some sketches, uh, drawings, um, 30 models, reference images. Uh, therefore you can see our real working process. Uh, uh, it's a graphic novel actually, and uh, inspired by um, another uh, Chongqing vernacular spectre. Uh, actually, it's a theater. Uh, uh, it's a theater. They play traditional local opera. Uh, the audience are all old people. And uh, so they can only afford the rent of car park. So this theater actually is in a car park. Uh, you can see uh, this building are in a very low place and under the uh, highway bridge and there's a river next to it. Uh, across river, there's a temple, uh, the temple of Dragon King. Um, in Chinese culture, Dragon King is uh, in charge of uh, water. However, in Chongqing, uh, during the summer, there's a lot of heavy rain, uh, both the temple of the the uh, Dragon King and uh, the cinema will um, be flooded. Uh, the first time I visit this place, I decided to make a graphic novel about it because there are so many uh, interesting elements. Um, the first image uh, across my mind is what would a underwater cinema looks like? <coughs> this is a screenshot from a very famous Chinese animation. Uh, it's this part is about the uh, dragon palace under uh, in the bottom of the sea. So I was wondering, there's a dragon king temple next to the cinema. Maybe uh, when the flood comes, the dragon king will swim into the underwater cinema and have a watching the performance by uh, sea uh, sea animals. And uh, there are also a lot of in beautiful, uh, interesting traditional architecture in Chongqing area. And I want to put these uh, buildings in my story. And definitely we need a huge dragon because it's so symbolic. And there is a car park building and there could be a ramp for cars. And uh, uh, the ramp can be renovated into a huge uh, dragon. So. By doing these brainstorms, the, uh, the story scene are gradually come into being. That's the first sketch. Um, uh, first sketch I made for this uh, graphic novel. And in terms of script, uh, I think I, I find that uh, our story is not driven by a character, not driven by plots, but driven by thin. Uh, um, imagine different things and uh, connecting them together by answering how these things come into being. Why is a cinema located in a car park building? Why they turn a ramp into a huge dragon? What happens um, after the cinema was flooded? So uh, by uh, answering these questions, the story are gradually developed. And this time we're also not satisfying just to depict the reality. We try to design something. Uh, this is a, a cinema entrance we designed. And this is another version referred to some traditional uh, Chinese cinema entrance. 
And finally, we decided to use this version, this vernacular construction, use the cheapest blue steel sheet, with a steel uh, plate with a uh, uh, big character of dragon on it. Uh, we also love this figurative architecture. I think most architects will laughing at this type of architecture and no uh, few clients will buy this. But actually we love this type of architecture and we can play uh, this type of architecture in our graphic novel. And this is a 3D model we have now. Uh, the ram have become the body of the dragon and the head of the dragon uh, is the entrance of the car park building. And there's also a office uh, in the head of the dragon. And uh, this is one spread nearly finished. Uh, that's what we have at the moment. Uh, I think this is the last project we uh, are going to share and our vernacular narrative should stop here. Uh, we start with a um, graphic novel and uh, ended in another uh, graphic novel. But this time, I think uh, we are eager to add more fictional part in the, in the graphic novel. But at the same time, we think we still need to try to keep the connection with the re reality, which I think is most important. Uh, but where this project going to lead us, uh, I don't know, just as Job said, you cannot <laughs> connecting dots with uh, looking forward. Uh, so maybe five years later, while looking back, uh, I can have a more clear uh, thinking about this one. Okay, that's all I want to share today. Thanks for your listening. Yes, thank you. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, wow. Um, I'm not sure what I can say now. I don't. I think anything I say will be coming down out of uh, out of a spectacular heist that you've taken us to. I have to say, I I always love seeing your work. I've seen I've seen a fair amount of it in person. Uh, maybe the most recent thing I saw was um, unpacking the city in uh, the SKS mall in Beijing, the Romoa shop that you did. Um, um, there are a million questions I wanna ask you, but I, I wanna just maybe start with something simple. And um, also let me say that uh, people who uh, may have questions uh, should just type them in and I can weave those questions into the conversation and we, we would love to have those. So um, first, let me just thank you for, for, for such a brilliant uh, lecture. It's, it's wonderful to, to see all this. I, I'm gonna start with something really simple and it will sound almost insulting, but um, <laughs> um, uh, your, the name of your studio seems obvious but there's something more to that uh, name than I think simply drawing architecture studio. Uh, obviously, you work a lot in two-dimensional two drawings. Uh, sometimes your drawings are documentations. Uh, sometimes they're documentations of a history that turn into beautiful drawings that are almost museum quality. I'm thinking of the drawings that you did for the um, for Building 42, uh, which were exhibited in Shenzhen, which I did get to see. Those four, they were really quite amazing. Um, sometimes your drawings tell stories, but sometimes even the drawings become walls of buildings. They become buildings, and so you know. So. What seems like a simple answer, drawing architecture studio, you're focusing a lot on, on drawing, on representation. You're also in a very interesting way, completely taking apart what we mean by a drawing. So I'm just curious, um, when you started your office, was that part of your intention or has that part of the organic growth of the office that you can only look back now and say, ah, that's what we were doing. So 
Why is your office drawing architecture studio? Uh, well, um... yeah, when we first started, we take drawing and architecture. Actually, at that time, we actually didn't have uh, any um, uh, thorough business plan mm -hmm. on how to run this, uh, run this studio. And uh, when we talk about drawing at that time, we are just talking about the drawings you see in the books, like um, a little bit of Beijing and uh, or some just a uh, uh, mere um, just, just some pure drawing that we don't think that it will get connected with the buildings at all. So we, we think that we will just do drawings and then to That's make really some good. design to, to make a living. Yeah, I think the first project actually is a book actually, I, as we uh, said in the lecture. Yeah. And you know, in actually in Chinese uh, drawing architecture, if you pr pronounce this in Chinese character, that means uh, can build, so it has another meaning. So you can build. So at the beginning, we still want to be, uh, we still want to do some real construction and the drawing is just a hobby. It's a place where we kind of running out the real world and uh, have a small uh, place for, for ourselves. Uh, but over these years, uh, the drawing has become our major uh, business. business model. It's <laughs> actually really, uh, we don't expect it when we started. At the beginning, we just use design to uh, raise our drawing, but now uh, it's kind of uh, turned over. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we think that the turning point was the project we did for Hyundai Motor Studio in Beijing in 2017 for that big wall in 798. That was the first time we were commissioned to such a big mural. And uh, we were very lucky that, that they have um, the, the client, they have all the technical uh, solutions. So we just deliver the drawing and they realized it in such a perfect way. And that was, that's become sort of like our um, uh, signature project. And the, so people get to know that the drawing can be used in that uh, material or in that uh, context. Mm. So that's what, that's when we started to get more commission to do this kind of uh, 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 like public art or like installation inside an architecture. So now this has this is really a gradual development for us. Yeah. Actually, we are happy with this uh, uh, current uh, direction because it's, um, I think it's a kind of, um, I think two, 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 two sides. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, uh, I feel it's quite a, a special way to, to practicing. And uh, but on the other hand is you are always, uh, um, always have distance with the mainstream. So because when you're talking about architect, it's about the construction, about the real building. Uh, and you are so, um, I think we have the two, two side feeling about this issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, I can I can see that, and and you know in in that uh, in that mural you're talking about at seven nine eight, that's a I think that's the Hyundai uh, commission project. In that project, also in the Ramoa project, but also in the um, the party school, uh, mm -hmm. I believe that's in Chengdu. Yeah. Um, there you also really make a building with drawings, right? So yeah. they're not really drawings of a building, they are mm -hmm. drawings that become a building, um, which, is, um, which is incredible. Uh, and when you see those and you see those in person, it's even, it's even more interesting. Um, you have what um, was that an intention? I mean, um, is that something that you set out to do, which is to um, make the drawing more than simply a representation and make the drawing something in and of itself, something for itself? Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the example you mentioned, the, the the project, the design we did for the party school. That was really in intentional. Like our intention was to make joy, like use drawing to reshape the the architecture, uh, because that's uh, this is the drawing has become when you talk about design strategy, drawing can 
we can say that drawing becomes one of our design strategies yeah. when we work on architecture, because we also uh, very often ask ourselves, well, if we do design, what specialty we can have compared to other architects? Because you see a lot of great projects every day, but uh, you always want to find a way to get a yeah. special or to yeah. get noticed. So drawing is our probably the most right. unique uh, instrument yeah. in this regard. Mm. Well, I think maybe uh, because um, actually I'm a little bit fed up with um, maybe modernism because uh, we clean. all clean, <laughs> comfort things. And uh, I think uh, if you're looking back uh, in long history of architecture, drawing and architecture, uh, building space are mixed together when you see the churches, Renaissance churches. So uh, uh, we, I guess I'm interested in this sort of everything mixed up together, decorations, different styles, that only in this way the architecture can go back, can, you know, can uh, get, get connection with uh, everyday lives, I think. So um, we deliberately to, uh, every time with the, uh, especially in recent projects, uh, we del deliberate to uh, strengthen on these uh, space and uh, drawing uh, combination uh, method. Yeah, we, we want to use uh, image as a kind of uh, building material. Yep. Mm. I think mm. that we think that this can be a building material. Just yeah. you, if you look at those uh, uh, frescoes, uh, mm. those new rows in the, as they have mentioned in those old churches. So this is sort of like a looking back to the history and get a uh, new inspiration. And also today, I think because with the LED, with the technology, the uh, medium become important. All the facade, I think, skyscraper facade are the uh, canvas. You know, ca canvas for image. So uh, if the future material, I think the future material building is not concrete, not uh, the wood brick, it can be image. Mm. I, I have a, quite, uh, a just a couple of other questions, and then I see some people are typing in some questions as well. I have a question about, um, uh, as I said earlier, some of your drawings are documentations. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. of them, they have, they take different strategies. Um, uh, some are autonomous. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm thinking especially of the of of, of building number forty two, um, which as I said I I was very lucky to get to see. There's a question I have that's related to your interest in the vernacular, mm -hmm. um, because um, and I think it's a kind of a paradox for all of us who are interested in the vernacular. Mm -hmm. So. Um, uh, that, as I understand it, that project started out with your interest in documenting what was a changing uh, urban condition. And if you didn't document it and tell that story, then we wouldn't know maybe what happened before, during, and after. And after the documentation shows um, in a very interesting way, that the final proposal and the final building that gets made is very boring and not interesting, except you make it look very great. Um, <laughs> but the most beautiful thing in the drawings are what we would normally think is the most ugly things, which is the construction mess, right? So, mm, so the the most beautiful and i remember when i saw this drawing at first it's almost like a fractal you you the closer in the more detail more detail more detail more detail and the rubble i mean in those drawings the rubble for me is the most beautiful part of the drawing for sure um now i i understand that but it's kind of a paradox in a way because <laughs> um, because in a way, if you really love the natural state of rubble, maybe the paradoxical thing is to make something very beautiful out of it. So, so the paradox is the vernacular, which you love and I love, 
is maybe better left alone, but when you focus on it, it becomes too beautiful. Um, <laughs> it becomes an autonomous designed object that's no longer vernacular. So what do you, how do you think about that? Well, I think it's a really good uh, question, really good observation. This question even uh, confused me a lot, actually. Uh, you know, when, when I do these, when we do these drawings, sometimes we just forget the content of the drawing, we forget the vernacular issue. We just focus on the drawing itself, you know, you just, uh, because, you know, when we do the actual drawing, you kind of enjoy the beauty of drawing, the lines, especially when you're doing the computer, you can zoom in and you make everything fitted together very accurate, then you kind of sort of forget this is a, actually a, a rubbish, rubbish or, or very dirty thing. You just pursue clean and uh, accurate shape, uh, everything, because this is the beauty of architectural drawing. But on the other hand, the content is totally different. It's, it's a very, um, very dirty, very orderly. <laughs> Um, I don't know, actually, I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I that, that's why I mentioned the degree zero. Uh, yes. I, recently, I, uh, I have, um, I even more confused about the concept concept at the beginning. I think degree zero is definitely right. You have to go to, uh, the push everything to the limitation to to extreme, that's the, the idea of degree zero. What we do in all these architect drawings is trying to push the beauty of uh, computer drawing, uh, AutoCAD drawing into its extreme. Uh, but however, uh, uh, when you go to this extreme in forms, uh, then you sort of losing the, the its content meaning. I think the content is also important. and. Uh, how to balance this, uh, the form and the content, I think is a, is mm. a problem we're going to solve in the future, I think. <laughs> yeah. 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 But uh, I also want to add that uh, if we take the example of the rubble you mentioned, uh, it's, totally, it's totally true that the, the feeling is different from the reality and from the drawing something very um, disorganized or ugly becomes very beautiful in the drawing. But mm. I think that is somehow the, the impact is the same. What we try to show in our drawings always is this impact, visual impact or the, uh, the impact on your perception because uh, what we uh, see in the sight of this demolishment, we are very, we are completely shocked. Mm. We, we saw the real rubbles and we got shocked. So we want to, to carry the same sharpness in the drawing, although not in the, uh, the, the realistic way, because you can use uh, photography to do that. But uh, yeah. so in, in terms of the, the sharpness, we want to uh, convey the same impact to our audience so they can feel the same sharpness as yeah. we did in on the site. Yeah. So that's probably just uh, a, just some small thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, yeah, that yeah, really no, I think, yeah, yeah, it's not a small. It's not a small thing. I think it. I think we we feel that when we see those drawings, and you feel that especially when you see them in person. Um, I'm gonna because we have a couple of very good questions here. I'm gonna formulate these into questions. So there are um, a couple of people. I think Alex and Lillian uh, are both interested in especially the the comic uh, dr uh, comic drawings and also you mentioned graphic novels you started with a book you yeah. ended with a graphic novel you have won many awards for books you you mentioned one but you've won uh, many other uh, book awards i know and also i know that many of our students have been influenced by your drawing style earlier i said um, uh, when we were talking, I was wondering how you would describe your drawing style. And you said very typically, mm, oh, it's just uh, axonometrics like everybody else does. Um, I think that's a clever trick, but of course I see right through it because 
um, because your drawings are not like anybody else's. Uh, they are they are absolutely unique and, and, and pretty remarkable. Can you tell us a little bit about how narrative and how graphic novels, how do you think about those and how does your work mm, in relation to that? Is that a form that you're interested in? Um, well, I think, um, yeah, we discuss about our drawing, but I think uh, on the one hand, it's really a, um, you know, a drawing without personal style because uh, the lines are made by AutoCAD. It's a very uh, mechanical lines, just a straight line, geometric shape is not marked by hand. So that means it's totally uh, mechanical, no personal character. Uh, but I think the character, <coughs> the most, for me, the uh, most important part, most import important part is how, uh, the first thing is the density. There are a lot of things. We always try to push a lot of things in one drawing. The other is uh, using different angles. So uh, especially when I'm teaching uh, the studio, I realized there's a, uh, I find for many students, they, the most difficult part is how to draw the uh, space in different angle and then put them together in one unity. That's, as I think it's the mm. most challenging part. And uh, maybe I think what we are strong or what we are good at is this, this part. A space maybe in a three dimensional, <clears throat> it's a continuous. But here, two-dimensional media, you want to uh, represent these different angles, this, uh, how to do that. Uh, that's what we are trying to uh, experiment with our architecture drawing. And in terms of graphic novel, um, actually, we are, you can tell from our style, we are very influenced by American uh, cartoonist uh, Brick Wire. And uh, uh, I think his drawing is just architecture drawing. He, the way he draw, he made, he used rulers, use these uh, uh, flat colors. Uh, the flat colors. That's just uh, each one is a beautiful um, uh, architecture drawing. So we like his book a lot. And uh, and I, I realized actually what we did in computer, what we made the architecture drawings, pretty. We can do roughly the same thing, mm -hmm. and they are they have same. Aesthetic, uh, uh, aesthetic value, uh, and um, uh, to me, firstly, uh, for graphic novel, uh, first thing is beautiful drawing. Otherwise, you just write words. It become novel, become. Uh, uh, but if you choose graphic novel, it takes a long time, much more time. It's inefficiency to tell story. Mm -hmm. So uh, the drawing becomes so important. So that's my um, thinking about. Yeah. Mm. A graphic novel to us is very uh, important uh, supplement to large drawings, mm -hmm. because when we uh, get inspiration from those narrative, uh, vernacular narratives mm -hmm. or vernacular uh, um, stories, that every story has its own best way to tell the story. Like uh, for example, the, the story for the building number 42, the best way is to use those pictures to give you the, the, the impact, the shock, the shockness. But for the story like uh, the Dragon Theater in the end of our lecture, mm. we think that uh, uh, of course the, uh, uh, the graphic novel will be much better because we try to put in much more information or much more uh, uh, dimensions in the story. So mm. for us, both of them are very important uh, formats. I have another, I'm going to combine a couple of observations that are also kind of questions. Mm -hmm. um, a number, a number of, um, a number of uh, comments in the chat uh, are observing that you're dealing a lot with um, a very complex and often chaotic canvas of um, elements that you catalog and you kind of mix them together. In some drawings, you do this with the, uh, with axonometrics done from very different points of view and they all kind of come to reside on the same canvas. Um, and so um, and so 
uh, I think one of the questions or some of the questions really have to do with, um, with that complexity and that density and how you fill the canvas up with that. I wonder if there's not a relationship to the question I asked earlier about the, um, about the rubble, which mm. is, um, and you gave, I think, a really powerful answer, which is um, there's a difference between simply documenting the complexity yeah. and, or the rubble and mm. transforming it into something completely different and completely new. And mm. I think that you didn't say this um, very, you didn't say this, but I think that's the answer to a, uh, a question that it comes also at the end, which is about copying. Um, mm. When you copy, um, what the, the uh, Greta asked, um, are you, um, what is the point of that? Because the copy is not as good as the original and what are you doing with that? And it reminds me also of your, your, your interest in uh, Robert Pinchuri and Denise Scott Brown, learning from Las Vegas, because in a way you're learning from vernacular, but I think it's more than that. I think you're completely transforming the vernacular into something that is not there. So mm -hmm. you're taking a cataloging of things that are there and you're transforming through your drawing techniques and through your imagination into something that isn't that isn't there. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that's a bunch of questions all at once, which is about copying mm -hmm. uh, vernacular and copying and how does the transformation of the vernacular into something original happen? And is that what you're doing? Yes, I think so. For me, actually, I think uh, because it's already, uh, I think nothing was totally new today. So everything is uh, uh, copied, copied somewhere. from somewhere. And, uh, uh, it, and also it's our working method. I think, uh, I think before we make drawing or make design, we always get a lot of reference images uh, if we don't get enough reference images, I, I'm not confident to do to make the uh, decision. Sometimes you feel you know there's a the really large world, and the, the more reference you get, the more things you get, you get more ideas, and then um, you try to. Uh, and also, I think it's kind of efficient way to do that. Uh, we are. Kind of agree with the artist uh, Monsieur Duchamp's found object. I think it's a clever way to do that. Nothing is totally new in artists. Mm. I think maybe in science is something totally new, but in art, uh, everything is re-explain, re reinterpreted. Re re yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think that's also uh, when we talk about copying, although it's not, we hope that the students they won't take it in a wrong way. <laughs> Let's say we. We just uh, to trace it. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about the copying, we think that uh, like our learning from the vernacular, we found that actually it's not possible you really just uh, repeat it 100%. Yes. It's yes. just, uh, it's always that you're some, your own understanding, your, your background. Like uh, when we look at the vernaculars, we look at it from the eyes of uh, professionals. Mm -hmm. So that's why we found that uh, something very unique out of them. So then when we, after we, reinterpret in our project it when it will never be the same as it looks like in yeah. reality so this is sort of like um natural transformation yeah. although our we always want to uh, experiment how much we can push further in this direction and uh, maybe uh, if we if we push harder and then we'll get something uh, look a little more original <laughs> just yeah. relatively more original in the end yeah. Well, I, I think everything you do looks to me very, 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 very original. I'm going to um, maybe ask, um, because we don't want to keep you um, all day, and um, we have appreciated you spending so much time with us. I'm going to ask maybe one final kind of question. Um, <laughs> we've talked mostly about two-dimensional um, mm. representation. You showed quite a lot of models, uh, student models in particular. 
where some of the same ideas that we've been discussing about vernacular are also true, where um, the vernacular models that the students found and modeled were actually better <laughs> in many cases than when they made up their own uh, uh, design. Um, but it's not because it was copied, it's because they transformed the vernacular into something different and new. Um, so some of those ideas are similar. I'm wondering, especially in the, if uh, I know, Leon, you, you, uh, you, uh, you've talked a lot about the zero degree model and mm -hmm. models that have um, an importance um, as an autonomous object. They're not a representation of something else. They are themselves something. Yeah. I wonder, is that also true of architecture and building projects themselves. So for example, in your, um, in the holiday home balcony, mm -hmm. is that a project, a maquette, a real building in and of itself, or is it part of a larger research on, hmm, on um, housing and on that condition? Maybe it's both, but I'm, I'm curious because, because in a way, Buildings are discrete things, models are discrete things, drawings are discrete things, but they're also part of a larger thing. So yeah, how do you, when you do um, um, what people would conventionally think of as an architectural project, like, a, like a, an apartment, yeah. how, does, how do you think of that differently than a, than a maquette or than a drawing? Well, uh, oh, well, it's a it's another good question, difficult to answer. <laughs> uh, um, well, uh, first of all, I believe uh, architecture uh, can be autonomous, and uh, um, it has its uh, definitely has its own value, and uh, just like drawings, like uh, models, uh, architecture has its. Um, <laughs> They, 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 it's all, it's all, it's all, it's all status. Um, I guess, well, uh, I'm not think quite clear about <laughs> Yeah, probably the architecture and the, the maquette, they can be another version of itself, like um, neutrally. Like yeah. when we do the, uh, the balcony, the, the apartments, yeah. it's, uh, you can say it's a, a uh, real, uh, real life size uh, maquette, maquette or, or vice versa, this kind of right. thing. But it's still a little different because when we made the uh, architecture design, we really focus on the construction. Mm -hmm. We focus on details, materials, uh, these things. I think that's, you can't say, well, uh, my architecture is about the concept. Concept is important. The construction is the shadow of the concept. I believe in architecture itself, the construction, the beauty of construction material itself. So I think the uh, autonomous of architecture uh, stay in uh, the real material, uh, uh, materiality. materiality. So that's uh, the architecture. And in drawing, maybe uh, architecture drawing maybe is another, uh, they, they have another different value. So mm -hmm. each one have its separate zero degree to me yeah yes so when we yes. design architecture we i think design is just maybe 10 percent working and uh, we spend most of energy on construction part <laughs> <laughs> um wow well uh i think we covered almost all the questions jenny asked a question about hutongs and mm -hmm. uh, and um i think she's uh, really curious about, she says, my question is, uh, should, should hutongs be destroyed later um, or should they, should the government keep them? I mean, I guess it's an interesting question about hutong because if you completely turn the hutong into a Disney project, then it's no longer the, the hutong. Um, <laughs> and, and, and therefore it's no longer vernacular. On the other hand, if you completely destroy them, um, then we no longer have hutong. It's a that's a it, the hutong is a very complicated problem. A pro problem, yeah. yes. Yes, it's a yeah. problem beyond our yeah. beyond our 
academic yeah. or professional yeah. uh, control. But so far, I think it's more conservative. I think at the moment we mm. the government at the moment the policy uh, prefer to keep the Hutton just as it is. Mm -hmm. No any anything new. Uh, 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 there's no anything new. But uh, uh, this um, we are totally against. I think we, we agree with John He that did, uh, uh, each history, uh, every period of history is, should, uh, be, should respected. be respected. And uh, uh, Hu Chong uh, should still, you know, still not, not just um, uh, that history, that shape of the history, mm -hmm. still can continue to evolve, evolve with contemporary life. Yeah. So, and also there's issues that because Beijing, uh, Hu Tong is in the best area in Beijing, the central area. And uh, unfortunately, our um, ancestor, uh, our, what do you say? Yeah, ancestor. uh, ancestors using this flat type of building, <laughs> which really inefficiency. So yeah. if you like this type of building, then that means economically it's can, can't running uh, okay. If you in in other in European country maybe the tradition building is multi level then it's kind of suitable for uh, modern contemporary yeah. life. But in Beijing it's just a single level building with a, a open courtyard in the center. It's totally against economy value. So that's another problem. So we have to uh, put something new rather than yeah. just keep it keep it as it is. But yeah. for a certain yeah. part, maybe it's a very well preserved courtyard housing. I think for this part, definitely we need to preserve it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh Lihan, uh Huyan, uh thank you, thank you so much for this fabulous lecture. We really uh appreciate you spending the time especially so early in the morning uh in beijing um <laughs> please That's give all part. of our students <laughs> give yeah. all of our students uh our good wishes and and uh we look forward to seeing all the work that you do in the future and that uh, you do with the students i'm going to turn it back over to Aureli and let her uh, end it, but thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you, you so much for, for having us. Yeah, yes, thank, thank you for your invitation. Mm -hmm. It's a great honor. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. And uh, the lecture should be available online pretty soon, so just watch out for it if you're interested. Thanks so much for coming. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning bye -bye. in Beijing. Good night here. Good night. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>